Next on Broadway Profiles, battling breast cancer on Broadway. I'll talk to Mandy Gonzalez about her incredible road to recovery. Plus, the Broadway stage, a Spike Lee joint. You'll hear from some of the stars of the new HBO film, American Utopia. And a little later, we'll talk to multi-platinum music star Josh Groban about his new digital concert series and his upcoming album. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is Broadway Profiles, presented by Broadway.com. Welcome to Broadway Profiles. I'm your host, Tamsin Fidel. Even though our theaters remain closed, Broadway continues to find new ways to keep us entertained. And some of our biggest stars have some incredible stories to tell about what their life looks like in this moment. Of course, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and if you know me, you know that's a cause very close to my heart. I lost my mother at a young age to breast cancer, and that's partially why I'm so drawn to the story of Mandy Gonzalez. She was diagnosed with breast cancer while starring in Hamilton on Broadway, and yet she continued to perform while undergoing treatment. And then COVID made her journey even more challenging. I talked to Mandy about what it was like to battle the disease during the pandemic and much more. I was diagnosed with breast cancer after my first mammogram on October 22nd of 2019. And so everything kind of happened very fast. And at the same time, I was doing eight shows a week um, in Hamilton where I played Angelica Schuyler. So a lot happened at the same time. We're just trying to figure out how to stay working, how to go through surgery and treatment. And then in January, when I started uh, chemotherapy, you started to hear like whispers about what was going on about coronavirus. I was lucky that in New Jersey, where I live, there's also another branch of Memorial Sloan Kettering. So I no longer had to travel into the city for treatment. You know, when you go with your whole family during COVID, it's really hard to keep everybody protected. And so it was really great that I was able, they were able to just kind of drop me off so that I could finish up my, um, my chemotherapy. You know, I had planned when I finished to ring the bell and to have my husband with me and um, that we did it together because I really look at cancer as not a me disease, it's really a we disease because it affects so many people around you. Um, as you're going through it, they're, they're feeling it too. And to not have him there was really, um, really heartbreaking for me. And I remember ringing the bell and then just kind of walking outside by myself and feeling, you know, I guess I'm done. And then all the nurses came outside and started to applaud. And my husband pulled up out of the parking lot and he and my daughter made signs that said, way to go mom and we're honking. And so I felt like we did it together and I got in the car and we cried. And uh, so I felt like we did get to have that moment together. And I'm happy to say that I'm cancer free and I'm happy to be thriving. So let's talk about what you did during uh, diagnosis and treatment because you were <laughs> in such a role with all eyes on you playing Angelica yes. Tyler in Hamilton, eight shows a week, a mother yes. coming back and forth into the city. How did mm -hmm. you do it? The way that I got through it, um, I really tried to be very secretive about it. And then my body started to, um, say no <laughs> you can't be quiet about it you're tired and this is hard and so when I was open I had a meeting with my company and when I was open about it it was like this weight had been lifted off music was so much a part of um, my healing it's been such a big part of my life it doesn't surprise me that it was part of my you know my it allowed me to to go on even if I didn't feel good that day I knew that you know, there was an audience waiting to see a show that um, they had been waiting years to see. And so it gave me that like extra push, you know, which I which I needed. You have been very, very busy. Um, yes. You wrote your first novel, mm -hmm. uh, a young adult book called Fearless. Talk yes. a little bit of when, when did you start? When did you do that? <laughs> when did I do that? I know. I think I, when I th look back, I just kind of go, when did I do all that? I decided that I wanted to write a young adult novel that deals with my love of Broadway and my love of friendship. So I created um, this story called Fearless. The main character is Monica Garcia, and she is coming to New York to pursue her dream. And she meets 
people along the way and those people um, become part of her squad and they go on this Broadway adventure. It couldn't uh, have been a better time, you know, going through what I went through, having to have a moment to sit. I was gonna use that to, um, to bring some goodness into this world. With Broadway still shut down because of the COVID-19 pandemic, shows and stars, they've had to pivot. And that's why we're seeing more and more Broadway plays and musicals on TV. The movie version of David Byrne's American Utopia premieres on HBO in mid-October. When American Utopia opened on Broadway, we spoke to the former Talking Heads frontman. Luckily, I have a pretty nice catalog of songs, so I can kind of cherry pick songs that help kind of create a narrative arc and kind of connect the dots, as it were, for what we're doing. There's other certain songs that I've done that may be really popular where I can go, okay, that one does not fit this particular show, but this one does. And there's plenty of popular ones in, that, we, that we're doing, and then there's some that are not so well known. But my experience has been that because the staging is, there's always something going on, uh, people get excited about the popular ones, but they, they don't lose, their attention doesn't waver when it's something new that they're getting. And now we're hearing from some of the performers in the upcoming film. Broadway.com correspondent Charlie Cooper has the story. Thanks, Tamson. David Byrne's critically acclaimed Broadway show has since been turned into a Spike Lee directed film that's coming to HBO this October. We sat down with a few of the stars to talk about what fans can expect. Sometimes when things are taken from the stage to film, the concern might be, is this gonna translate? Is it is the message still gonna feel the same? Is the you know the energy still gonna feel the same? Um, I know that you guys were in the Hudson Theater performing this, and I know it's an intimate space. Now you're bringing it into someone's most intimate space, their homes. So can you kind of speak on how performing at the Hudson maybe will help this translate a lot better? It's interesting because on the road we did uh, I think 240 something shows and every space was different. Uh, yeah. And so we were really used to kind of just going with the flow and figuring out, adapting to whatever space we're in. Uh, and I, I think, you know, when we got to the Hudson, it was this extreme weird kind of comfort that we weren't used to, to be in the mm -hmm. same place over and over again, literally not a different theater every, every day, which is what we did on the road. And so I think it was like this perfect timing of like Spike coming in when we were in this like really deep stride of the show of having created this energy on the road and then coming into this space and really honing it. You know, with Spike filming, we had to become acclimated and being able to play on the same stage for 16 plus weeks, uh, it became more comfortable for us and so Spike had points where he would film on stage while we were performing. So because we had, you know, we were really comfortable with the spacings, um, that's kind of what brings it, you know, the audience on stage with us, because you're seeing it from different perspectives that you won't, you wouldn't see when you're sitting in the audience. So you're gonna see like from above head or you'll see how our feet move, you know, you're just really immersed in it. And I think that's what Spike did that made it really amazing and kind of bring it to life for everybody. And you guys have a particularly hard job because you're singing, you're dancing, you're playing instruments. Like, how is your brain even like, functioning? Playing an, a, an instrument with your hands that's also moving with you and you're doing the choreography and you're singing. It's definitely like a, you know, one of these type of things where you're just like, yeah. can I do this? I had never sung with David before, before the first day of rehearsal. And to walk in that room, he could have treated me like a backup singer. He really was just open to everyone having input in the development of the songs and the tunes and the way that we created them. And that I think is not only unique for an A-list celebrity like David Byrne, I think that's unique for any lead artist at any level. Another great show from the past Broadway season is coming to TV this month. Amazon Prime Video has picked up the rights to the film version of What the Constitution Means to Me. The show's creator and star, Heidi Schreck, was Tony nominated for both the play and the performance. I had a chance to talk to Heidi about what this show means to her now 
more than ever. Uh, when I was 15 years old, I would travel the country giving speeches about the Constitution at American Legion halls for prize money. This, uh, this was a scheme invented by my mom to help me pay for college. I feel like you were on the cutting edge of what we are dealing with now on a daily basis without realizing just how important that this was your message is going to be. Yes, I mean, it's interesting because I've been working on the show and actually performing it, parts of it, for about a decade. You know, I performed it first while Obama was president. I, I mean, I obviously had no idea what would happen over the course of those 10 years. But because I think the show is delving into my own personal history and then things about our country, problems in our country that are centuries old, it, it just so happens that every time I perform it, it relates to what's going on in a new way. People come to Broadway and they see a show. Um, having it on Amazon though and reaching a different audience, I think now your message is mainstream and it's getting out there in a whole different way. Would you agree? I hope so. I just want, you know, theater is um, prohibited for a lot of people. It was for me as a little, um, a little kid and as a young person who loved theater, I grew up in a tiny town in Washington State. Um, I couldn't come to Broadway. Uh, I couldn't even really go very often to a big city to see a show. So I just hope, I, I want theater to be accessible to more people and I'm excited that, um, that we get to do that with this show. That somebody like me, who grew up in a small town and didn't have a lot of access will get to see it. We're gonna talk about another fantastic film based on a Broadway play coming up in just a few minutes. But first, the Broadway community is sending out the SOS to Congress, calling on lawmakers to provide financial relief in the face of this ongoing shutdown. We're talking about the Save Our Stages Act, or SOS. This is a bipartisan bill that would provide $10 billion in grants to live venues across the country. Of course, Broadway has been shut down since March, and a lot of this money we're talking about would be a much needed lifeline to the hundreds of small businesses that make up the Broadway industry. Broadway remains closed through at least January 3rd, though the shutdown is expected to last longer than that. And that means tens of thousands of Broadway workers in New York City and across the country remain off the job. That's why the SOS is so desperately needed right now. And right now, there are signs of life on Broadway. The Marquee for the Music Man, starring Tony Winters, Hugh Jackman, and Sutton Foster, is now up at the Winter Garden Theater. Previews for that show are scheduled to begin in April 2021. Still plenty more to talk about on this edition of Broadway Profiles. Up next, the boys are back in town. The new Netflix film, The Boys in the Band, is now streaming, starring the same A-list talent from the 2018 revival. We're going to talk about it. Plus, she's one of Broadway's hottest young stars. You'll meet Jagged Little Pill's Lauren Patton. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and you're watching Broadway Profiles. If you're looking for A-list movie stars and top-tier Broadway talent, look no further than The Boys in the Band. It's streaming right now on Netflix. Broadway.com's editor-in-chief, Paul Wontorek, is here with the story. Hi, Paul. Thanks, Tamsin. The Boys in the Band has been iconic for more than 50 years, but this new film takes it to an even higher level. This is gonna be fun. <laughs> This super slick production stars the same amazing cast as the 2018 Broadway revival, including guys like Jim Parsons, Matt Bomer, Zachary Quinto, and Andrew Rannells. The story is about a group of gay friends who come together to celebrate a birthday, only to have their evening turned on its head by an uninvited guest. I had a chance to chat with the film's director, Joe Mantello. The cast is it, an amazing group of people, and they're all openly gay, which is just sort of the, the frosting on the cake. It sort of makes it a special, it's a, I mean, it makes it special. A lot of these guys uh, were my friends before this project. And you know, we sort of just went, went character by character and talked about who we thought might be uh, the best, most interesting choice for the role. What was it like creating the world? Creating the world that, that, that they're living in is very important. 
you know, obviously it has to be said in 1968, right? It, you know, yeah. But what, what we tried to do was to also give it a kind of a, a timeless quality. And there's a lot of space in the apartment. So there's a terrace and there's an upstairs and there's a downstairs and there's a kitchen. And, uh, and there's a wraparound portion of it. And then a storm comes and then they're all in the room. And so it kind of works its way inward and the, and the compression starts. Um, do you ever wonder, like, who who would you have been at that party? Which of those guys? Uh, just, do you ever think about that? What what life would have been like? I mean, I see myself in I see aspects of myself in 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 many of them. The thing about this play is that everybody says the same thing. It's about gay self loathing. But I also found little moments of tenderness and forgiveness and heroism. One of Broadway's fastest rising stars, Lauren Patton, just celebrated her 28th birthday. She's really one of the breakout stars of Jagged Little Pill. She originated the role of Joe, and she tears the house down when she sings the classic Alanis Morissette song, You Ought to Know. She's tonight's fresh face. I grew up outside of Chicago. It was nice being close to the city because I could go see theater from the time that I was a young kid. And uh, I started community theater in the suburb next to ours. And uh, yeah, but then by the time I was 12, I was working professionally in the city. And I did a Kraft mac and cheese commercial when I was five and stuff. It just ridiculous. And I remember just thinking it was fun and I got to get out of school and there was a bunch of free food at the commercial shoot and I thought that was cool too. So it was just fun. My first play uh, was at the community theater and I did the best Christmas pageant ever and I played uh, the really, really bratty youngest kid. I just got an excuse to be a brat on stage and then people clapped for me. <laughs> It was very, it was very egocentric at the start of it. And as I got older and started to do it, I realized, oh, I can also tell stories and impact people and stuff. But, you know, let's be honest, it started with thinking it was fun to do funny things on stage and have people clap. <laughs> there's something, I think, when you first move to New York, it's uh, so vibrant and there's so much going on that is both overwhelming and so exciting. It's an odd and beautiful thing to have been the only person to play this role because I've been with it from the first reading. The creativity in that is really exciting because you're really a part of shaping who this character is. Coming up on this edition of Broadway Profiles, welcome to the Moulin Rouge. When we come back, we'll introduce you to one of the awesome dancers from Broadway's hottest mega musical. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is Broadway Profiles. We'll be right back. When the 2020 Tony Awards happen later this year, one of the shows eligible for Best Musical is Moulin Rouge. The show combines more than 70 pop songs with some truly unbelievable choreography. And one of the great members of that ensemble is Erica Hunter. We talked to her about why she's just gotta dance. Hi, I'm Erica Hunter. I grew up in Ottawa, Canada. I have an older sister named Vanessa and she was uh, put into dance at age three. So when I was three, my mom put me into dance. When I was put into it, I'm like a typical middle child. So I'm like just looking for attention, trying to excel. I just like really found an outlet in it and I just felt so alive. I didn't even know I wanted to do this as a career. I just found out about auditions and I just thought of it like as a free dance class. My first audition was for the Radio City Rockettes and it was in Toronto. And my parents drove me there and I auditioned and then I got it. And I was like, okay, well, I guess I have to leave high school early. I ended up um, going into The Lion King in Toronto immediately as soon as I finished Radio City. I just started auditioning for stuff and I just spiraled into this career. And before I knew it, I was in New York City in Flower Drum Song in a Broadway revival. I've been lucky enough to open um, like five other shows. It just makes me think of my career and like how I got to where I am and how special it is that I've got to spend like 17 years of my life on Broadway now. Whenever I've tried to limit myself, I'm like, well, I'm not sure if I can dance anymore. I'm getting like older or whatever. And then a show like Moulin Rouge comes along and it's pretty nice to be in a place where you're just like, wow, I'm here, I'm doing something really special and I can celebrate what I've done before, but celebrate moving forward. I'm Tamsin Fidel and you're watching Broadway Profiles. Welcome back to Broadway Profiles. I'm Broadway.com's Editor-in-Chief, Paul Wontorek. 
Multi-platinum music superstar Josh Groban is on tour virtually. He's holding a series of virtual concerts in support of his upcoming new album, Harmony. We had a chance to chat. You are immersing yourself in a lot of music and a lot of concerts, which is exciting. So, um, yeah, you're doing a, a trio of concerts. So it started with, you know, some Zoom concerts and I was singing in my shower for a little bit and, you know, just connecting with friends and fans and the ways that I could just from the confines of my home. And at some point, my manager said, you know, I think that this is going to be a while and we should start thinking about ways where we can really reach out to people around the world. And so we decided kind of on a wing and a prayer to do um, a live stream that we did in June. And we decided to just, you know, make it very broken down and we would take requests and I would answer some questions that they were coming in real time and thinking maybe two people will show up, maybe a thousand, who knows. And, um, and, and we wound up getting 63 countries tuning in. How, how does music help you get through these times? Is it an escape for you and digging into projects like this? Is this really sort of what you need to, to oh, keep yourself going in a healthy way? I, I, I need it. It's my lifeblood right now. I think for so many people, both listeners and creators, it's, uh, it's, one, of the, it's one of the things that we can still enjoy to the fullest. On the one hand, there's a community of togetherness that the grading curve is that we are all in this together. But we, of course, we know that there are different levels of that and privileges in that and, and different ways that people are coping and different, different, um, you know, different ways that people are trying to get through this. But one thing that is, I think, universal for all of those ways is music and is art. To be able to write has been exceedingly therapeutic. I thought with Harmony that I was going to be making um, really just a covers album this time. I, I had I had written to my heart's content on my previous album. We did a big year long tour for that. And usually I need a little more time to recharge the writing tank and I want to take my time with that. So I thought, you know, this album, I'm just going to pick songs that I've wanted to sing forever and fan requests and great arrangements and just sing my face off. Um, and of course, like songs just came about. So this is going to be, a, you know, an, an album of of, co of covers with a couple of new original songs that are, are two of the most poignant that I've ever written. So it's it's been life-saving for me um, doing these live streams. And that's going to do it for us. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is Broadway Profiles, presented by Broadway.com. <laughs>